about Caroline? Well, it was, it was a beautiful day, sunny, sky, clear, clear blue sky, and Caroline was out uh, on, a, on her pony macaroni, and I was leading her around, which I did quite often, and uh, she said to me, Mr. Landis, I want to see Daddy. So, said, okay, why not? I th thought the president was in his office, and so I wandered over, uh, Caroline and Pony in tow, and we get over to the, past the Rose Garden, and walk out to the, the patio outside the uh, Oval Office, and clomping along there, and uh, I peeked, the door was open, so I kind of peeked around the corner to see, and the President was sitting there at his desk, so I said, okay, why not? So I opened the screen door, and uh, Pony, Macaroni, and Caroline and took them in. And the president, if I could have had a picture of the president's face at that time, his jaw dropped and his utterly, in utter amazement. And uh, I mean, he looked up and he got this big smile on his face. And then he walked over to me and he said, Mr. Landis, I really don't think this is a very good idea. And I kind of at that point agreed and I uh, thought, I'd better get this pony out of here before it does its doo-doo and I end up in big doo-doo too. So. All right, we interrupt this broadcast with a What is it? What is it, Emily? Hey, uh, we have never, I personally cannot remember us ever getting more requests about covering a subject what? than we did this story that broke, I believe, on Saturday with former Secret Service agent Paul Landis. It's taking the world by storm. We got a major bestseller. We have a presidential candidate who's saying that it's solving the mystery mm. of what went on. So we got to look into it. What's going on? You know, it's funny when you look at the mainstream news, when they cover these things, how um, they don't give any details whatsoever. You know, even podcasts, I'm looking at these podcasts thinking, all right, because they're all over the Internet. You know, JFK thing, I, I am an expert on the thing. <laughs> and then you watch it and you're going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And there's no beat. There's no beat. They just go around in a circle about this guy, Paul Landis. They don't even know who he is. I mean, these cats don't even know. I mean, the, the only one who really knows this stuff is uh, Vince Palomara, the uh, leading expert on um, the Secret Service and the JFK assassination. And and he knows this stuff inside and out. He's interviewed almost all of them, including Landis, um, who is now almost 90 years old and has come out with a book uh, just to give everybody a heads up on what the theme of the book is, because all of these books are basically the same. That's Landis. I don't know when that was taken, but um, all of these books are the same. And we covered the Frazier book, didn't we, uh, Eric, when that came out? The Wesley Buell Briefly. Frazier? Briefly, right? Okay, so to make a book uh, work, to get a book deal, and just to explain, because this is complicated stuff, if you're not in the business, to get a book deal in the JFK uh, area, uh, you have to be connected in some way and have to come up with at least one new twist to the thing. So we read the book, I read the book by uh, Wesley Buell Frazier, and you know, you're reading this thing and um, he's not a writer. And the one thing he adds at the very end of the book, completely having nothing to do with the book is, I saw some men putting some rifles in the trunk of a car at the school book depository after the shooting. I swear, that's how simple it is in the book. And that justified for him to get a book about his involvement in the JFK assassination for Frazier. Now, Frazier didn't write that book. Frazier says in the book that Gary Mack and his son merely texted him questions that he answered in a return text or emails and that was his involvement. He's the author of the book. He's the author of the book. But in the book, he says that his son, Gary Mack, and another lone nutter, uh, I forget who the guy was, uh, having something to do with the uh, 
Texas School Book Repository Museum, were the authors of the book. Okay. So you think to yourself, hmm, this guy here, Paul Landers, Eric, he's almost 90. He's never written a thing in his life. Books are hard. I've written a book. It's brutal, right? How does this guy wake up at the age of 88, 89, 90, and just start writing a book? It's not so easy, right? But let's go and find out who Paul Landis is, first of all, because people are going to have to know that video that you're showing. Paul Landis uh, goes back to this is where we're going to get into the actual weeds on stuff that other podcasts and other news services will never do. Here you're going to get as mo more information than you need to know about this subject so we can put it to rest because these are going to keep popping up. I've told this to people on the show. We're going to get these deep state movies. It's the 60th anniversary. We're going to get phony books. We're going to get a lot of stuff. And there's going to be a big splash because that's how it's done, people. They don't put out these books from the deep state or put out these deep state movies so they'll be obscure on some video shelf in Bosnia. They put these out to move the needle, to move the limited hangout, to move the narrative. That's what they want to do here. This is a, a narrative that's been moving by them, uh, saying that Oswald was involved in a conspiracy. There were others, but he is always involved. Keep that in mind. The real JFK researchers who've been doing this say he's a patsy and not involved. What well, they're now moving the goalpost and the needle to tell you with books and films is he's part of a conspiracy, but he definitely did it. Don't be sucked into that phony narrative. But let's get back to Paul Landis. Paul Landis was part of the Eisenhower administration, a secret service that covered the Eisenhower administration. He watched over the uh, grandchildren of, um, I don't know if that's John John. This may be John John. I'm talking about the Eisenhower administration. Mm -hmm. um, this is a little later, Eric. So um, what what... He goes back to a couple of years before Kennedy is what I'm trying to say. And he comes on board and um, moves into the Kennedy detail. Now, because he was part of the child watching babysitting detail, which is part of the Secret Service that nobody wants to be involved in. He starts out, by the way, with counterfeiting, uh, like a lot of guys did in the Treasury sure. Department, and then moves into the babysitting detail. He was a diminutive guy. Uh, small, you know, kind of likable looking, non-threatening. It wasn't like a hulking, weird, giant guy like Emery Roberts and some of the other scary looking guys like Kellerman and some of the others. So they took this guy and they, gave, they assigned him to the children of Eisenhower or the grandchildren. So he gets the same role with the Kennedy detail. He's in charge of John John and Caroline and the pony story that you just ran is he, for reasons that are inexplicable, ran a pony into JFK's office, uh, totally insane, because Caroline wanted to show uh, her dad, Macaroni, the pony uh, may have cost him his job, but JFK didn't do that. Uh, so anyway, he ends up with the kids and he ends up sharing, uh, he gets promoted from the kids patrol to uh, Jackie with Clint Hill. So him and Clint Hill uh, kind of split Jackie between the two of them. Clint Hill wrote a book, Me and Jackie, or whatever his book was. He seems to have a mad crush on her and uh, whatever. They shared cigarettes together, her and Clint Hill. Um, I think this is her uh, possibly in Italy. That's Paul Landis in the white shirt on the left. I don't know who that guy is on the right there, but um, I think that's Jackie in Italy getting ice cream or something. And uh, this uh, also, I think... Um, I, don't know, I want to say like Monte Carlo or something, looking at a, the Egyptian museum or something with her sister over there. Um, anyway, so she, he becomes part of the uh, White House detail. And uh, when they go to Dallas, he uh, is assigned, like Clint Hill, to guard Jackie. Unfortunately, if you remember the opening segment at the tarmac, Eric, when Emery Roberts waves off Don Lawton from uh, the bumper of the car. Now, Clint Hill should have been and was jockeying back and forth on that rear left bumper of the car because that's where he should have been to protect Jackie, Clint Hill. Uh, to alternate, it would have been uh, Paul Landis who should have been on that same side. 
Paul Landis is put on the right side rear runner of the vehicle and he they gesture for Don Lawton to get on board and there's no room really. He's going to climb into the um, uh, Landis is going to climb into the vehicle and let Lawton get on board. Uh, you'll see him. He's on the left with his head turned. The left second guy in the back of the uh, the Queen Mary there, that boat of a, of a caddy. Uh, that's obviously Clint Hill in the front right. And the back, you'll see Paul Landis looking back, uh, I presume, in my opinion, the Dow Tech building. Uh, but nevertheless, they hear shots. There's a whole new thing I'm going to get into at some point about firecrackers being used by the military uh, on this day and in other military operations. Apparently, somebody posted a thing I stumbled onto um, a couple of weeks ago about using firecrackers as a distraction militarily for sniper fire and other things. And they go into detail in this article about where it's been used uh, historically, going back to World War II with the Japanese. Um, anyway, that's a, that's a story for another day. So uh, this guy is now on the rear portion of the uh, uh, Secret Service car. Now you say, well, you know, what difference does it make? Well, I mean, his job was to protect Jackie and uh, he was, should have been up there in the front, whatever. But he's not. Okay. Well, where was, where was Landis? Where was Landis before this? Landis uh, turns out to be one of the nine Secret Service agents that get shit face, shut up, get shit faced at the cellar and uh, drinking white lightning or whatever they called it back then. They had a different name for it. He was there till 5 a.m. in the morning, Eric, and he shows up at work at 8 a.m. Uh, with Clint Hill. Uh, I don't know where the three hours went. I don't know if he lost his gun. I don't know if he was one who lost his ID, but there were nine of them castigated by the Warren Commission, specifically Earl Warren, who said they should have been fired uh, for violating uh, directly Secret Service policy. And James Rowley famously told the Warren Commission that they had suffered enough. This is the a scene from the cellar, which I think we've, we've covered before. Uh, uh, Pat, what's his name's uh, place? who was a friend of Jack Ruby, had no liquor license, but they served setups and they had Pat's uh, uh, special white lightning that he would serve for the setups. And of course, George Carlin famously there that night, as told to me by George Carlin himself, uh, doing an impersonation of JFK. Uh, so there's a whole world there. There's the owner of the place as a friend of Jack Ruby's uh, really sketchy, sketchy gun runner and a bunch of different things that he was involved in. People in Texas and Fort Worth know the cellar very well. I went by there when I was in Fort Worth, uh, still there. Um, it had folk music. It had uh, waitresses and bikinis. It was a hippie beatnik hangout. Why the Secret Service was there is because it was open. They had gone to uh, get some food at a press club that had closed and these nine Secret Service agents proceeded to the cellar. And the cellar was a notorious, uh, notorious hangout. Uh, and there they proceeded to get shit faced. He claims he only had uh, two of these white lightning drinks, had some scotch drinks. This is his admission, you know, Paul Landis's admission. And from what I understand, it was far worse than that. Um, so, okay, so who, again, is Paul Landis? Paul Landis is now hungover. Paul Landis now comes to <laughs> comes to the airport. He lands. He, he's on the back of this car holding on for deal life, uh, where Don Lawton, I guess, should have been. And um, he now does nothing. He is told to stay on board the car by Emery Roberts, and, and Vince has covered this pretty well, and I'm not going to go into step on Vince's stuff, but I, I recommend everyone go and check out Vince Palomara's YouTube channel, uh, which has the deepest, deepest inspection of the uh, uh, de-shielding of JFK by the Secret Service on that day, and he goes into great details about this. Now, Paul Landis talks about the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Paul Landis said there were three helicopters on the back of the uh, White House lawn. And uh, the first one, this is if we went to war with Cuba, the first helicopter was for JFK to escape the White House. The second helicopter, which he was going to go on, was the family, Jackie and the kids. The third helicopter 
was for high-ranking officials. And he said to uh, his supervisor, how do I know who's a high-ranking official? What if they just start, you know, cramming in and trying to get on that helicopter or the one with Jackie? And he was given orders to shoot to kill anyone who tries to get onto that helicopter that's not authorized. Now, th this could have been a lesser official, but it was not like uh, the hoi polloi were going to jump on that helicopter. It might have been the undersecretary of state, <laughs> you know, for Thailand or something, but he was going to get shot, according, again, to, to Paul Landis. Now, you have to take Paul Landis with a grain of salt, uh, as, as, as Vince has told me uh, personally. Now, Vince has interviewed Paul Landis three times, three or four times, in the mid 90s and he's interviewed sam kinney he's interviewed everybody um but he, he was it took him a while to get landis and landis's uh claim to fame was that he had ptsd uh from the event didn't want to deal with the media never testified before the warren commission was never asked to testify issued a statement and uh later for six months after the assassination was assigned to jackie and the kids and that's what he did for six months and then he never asked to testify never asked to testify nor did they mm. ask him now keep in mind he in his statement said there was a conspiracy and that the gunfire came from the front that's why he was not asked to testify the warren commission did not want that on the record it's in his statement eric in land <laughs> statement that he believes a bullet came from the front uh, and hit kennedy in the head and he's also contradicted himself and i'll get into that in a, in a, in a second but he was not asked to testify. Um, and I just want to read RFK Jr.'s statement because it, it, it really needs to be analyzed. The magic bullet theory is now dead. This preposterous construction has served, if you could put it up on the screen, as the mainstay of the theory that a single shooter murdered President Kennedy since the Warren Commission advanced it 60 years ago under the direction of the former CIA director, Alan Dulles, whom my uncle fired. The recent revelations by JFK Secret Service protector Paul Landis have prompted even the New York Times among the last lonely defenders of the Warren report to acknowledge its absurdity. Now, I don't use my, uh, I, I don't go by what the New York Times is doing for my own uh, take on the JFK assassination. So that's meaningless to me. But I don't understand how this goes out the window because of Paul Landis's book or Paul Landis's statement. I don't know uh, why the magic bullet theory would still be alive, but I think what he's saying is that now even the last institution, the New York Times, is questioning the magic bullet theory. Again, I, I don't know how this revelation helps or hurts the magic bullet theory, uh, but we'll get into it. So Landis claims that uh, on the top of the seat in the back of the limo, after they extract JFK from Jackie's hands, Kellerman and Hill put the coat over his head and that allows Jackie the space mentally to allow them that first of all they had to get John Connolly out of there in the jump seat so the gurney rolls up this is a Parkland and they extract John Connolly from that limousine because they can't get to JFK's in the back seat uh, back of the jump seat okay bloody mess everything she's holding on to him for dear life uh, uh, Kellerman and Hill say, please, Miss Kennedy, please let go of him so we can help your husband. He's still breathing, blah, blah, blah. So they put a coat over his head and that allows them to extract JFK from the thing and put him on the gurney. So there's a huge controversy now because they're going to come out with soap and water and begin to clean all the evidence, blood and everything out of the limousine. But before that happens, Paul Landis claims that the pristine 399 magic bullet in all its glory is sitting on the top, the top, not in one of the creases, the top where the the seat meets the metal of the back of the limo. If you show that again, Eric, maybe we could be a little bit more specific. If I had a pointer, I would be able to do it, but I'm going to try to explain it by Eric putting mm -hmm. that, putting right. that photo. Just put the same photo. Yeah, again. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you look at the top black part above the black padded part where it meets the metal of the back of the trunk higher up yep yep in there right in there and that ridge that's where paul La i don't know if it's that big but well, <laughs> that's where, that, yeah. yeah yeah in there paul landis claims he takes the intact 
bullet, three ninety nine in its intact beauty, puts it in his pocket and goes into Parkland. Now, if you read Clint Hill's book about me and Jackie, Paul Landis and him are merely doing guard duty of doors. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. They're really doing sentry duty inside. I mean, the doctors are working feverishly. He stays with Jackie Paul Landis, as does Clint Hill. And uh, another uh, guy shows up who was at the the trademark um, named uh, Richard Jensen, Johnson, which I'll get into in a second. You want details, people? I'm going to give you freaking details on this case. So there's no debate as to what's going on. I really want people to understand what's going on here and get into the weeds. I had to stop the thing on the spies to do this. So, so you know, it's a little frenzy for me because I was about to do the commie spy episode when I got the bat signal from Hunley. Uh, that we have to switch to this, which I agree, it, you know, it's, it's necessary to do this before this book uh, goes completely psycho. So anyway, so so he goes in and he takes this bullet, according to himself, and it's in his pocket and he puts it on the gurney of JFK and uh, walks away. And when explaining why he did it, he simply says that this was an important piece of evidence and he wanted it to be next to the body. Just think about what I'm saying here, folks, because this is really where it gets crazy. Uh, he says this, this <laughs> Paul Landis has the bullet in his pocket and puts it on the gurney, not next to the body because the body's long gone, on the gurney of the president of the United States. Now, this is severely disputed because Nobody found, a, none of the nurses found a bullet on the gurney of the president of the United States. The, the gurney itself was monitored 24-7 by these nurses who cleaned up the blood and were guarding it. The bullet now somehow turns up on the gurney of John Connolly. And the Warren Commission says it's the bu magic bullet and it came out of John Connolly. This is really crazy. Uh, uh, Landis claims he specifically put it on the gurney of, of JFK. I don't know how he knows JFK's gurney, but that's what he claims. Now, in the movie JFK, you see a shadowy kind of attempt by Oliver to show maybe that the who was there was Jack Ruby, who who was who was spotted and talked to uh, by a reporter on numerous occasions that day at uh, at at uh, Parkland Hospital. And what Oliver does is he hypothetically puts a shadowy um, Jack Ruby placing the bullet on the stretcher. You know, whether that happens or not, it's just his take on it. There's no evidence of that one way or the other. Um, but Seth Cantor, who was the reporter, the Dallas reporter, uh, interfaced with Ruby at uh, Parkland. So it is possible Ruby denies ever meeting Seth Cantor there. Seth Cantor knew him for years. Seth Cantor said Ruby was at Parkland. Why he was in that hallway at Parkland is speculation, but it is crazy and not impossible that uh, Ruby did this. Uh, that being said, uh, Paul Landis says he did it. <laughs> so I don't think we need to think about Ruby anymore if you believe Paul Landis. So you just go, all right, well, who is Paul Landis? Why should we believe Paul Landis? At this point, I just want to read a statement that Vince Palomara has sent me uh, about the situation about Paul Landis. And this is his statement to our audience and to me um, about Paul Landis. And this is from Vince last night. Landis sounds like an old man, 88, trying to make one last score of money. He is a mixed bag. He initially wrote two reports stating that the shots came from the front, then changed his mind in 2010. He said in 2016 that he did not believe the single bullet theory, yet he also believes Oswald acted alone. I don't know how that's possible. Now he is coming out with this bullet business, and there is no way short of a lie detector to know if he's telling the truth or not. Landis is an enigma. You know, love Vince. So, I mean, that's his take on Landis, who he's interviewed. So he knows the guy, obviously, better than I do. But I know uh, some things that may not be um, public about this situation with uh, Paul Landis. So uh, Paul Landis then, then ends up going on Air Force One back to uh, the White House, where his assignment continues on Jackie for six months. Uh, and the kids. So that's his job. He goes back and he says he's traumatized by the entire event. Traumatized, says he has PTSD, never reads the Warren Commission report, never reads, this is by his own admission, never is called before the Warren Commission, never reads the report, never reads a book, never talks to any reporter uh, reporters about it. Eventually, Vince gets him. Um, and 
in 2010, he ends up on the last, uh, the JFK detail, the last detail done by the Discovery Channel, where they brought together all these guys uh, for a reunion for a book. I think it's called The Kennedy Detail was the show. Here's a photo of them with the producer, I think, is in the green outfit, the woman who wrote the book, and she got them all together and did this uh, TV thing on Discovery or something. Okay, so he's now got PTSD. <laughs> so he can't get involved in anything. Um, but let's get a little look of his background. Okay, he's born in Worthington, Ohio. He's uh, really raised, Toledo is raised in Columbus. And uh, October 14, 1962, he's assigned to Jackie and the kids. He starts off, his code name is Debut, by the way, Eric, because he's new to the detail and they look at him and he's very young, he's 29 years old. Like I said, he was doing Ike's grandchildren and um, he, um, you know, has this, according to him, PTSD and that's why he doesn't want to look back. It was so traumatic for him, the assassination, that he is a uh, mental case. And But yet for six months, he continues to professionally guard the Kennedy family. There's no episodes uh, of insanity or anything else. He does a professional job and he, and he quits. And you say to yourself, he's got PTSD, right? What did he do between that time when he retired and um, the time he wrote the book? You just go, okay, well, that will indicate whether he's got PTSD. Okay, here's what he did. You ready? Mm -hmm. This is Jobs. He was a real estate agent, a professional hand model, a film production company owner, a machine shop employee, a house painter, a handyman, and now he's a security guard at a museum. This is a guy who claims to have uh, been completely destroyed mentally and has PTSD. Those are the jobs that he's done since he was a Secret Service agent. Um, they're strange jobs. The film production company uh, uh, owner is really an odd one. And how about professional hand models? That's my favorite. Right. How do you get <laughs> um, well, hey. Oh, hmm. Dude, how do you, you, get... <laughs> <laughs> you get that job, bro? I mean, I, I'd like to do that one. Okay, so there's a guy who's brought in. Now, this guy, I don't want to get into this because I want to get into the book and and really explain the book to these people because it's, like i said it's really difficult to write a book it's even more difficult when you're freaking 90 years old and you're a security guard at a museum so there is a publishing house in chicago that published this book right so there's a guy and i, I want people to remember who dan moldea is dan moldea is a mob author a guy writes off about mob books he wrote about the rfk assassination he ended up being the handler for uh, uh, Thane Eugene Caesar, the alleged assassin of RFK. He became the handler and he brokered deals to interview him. He tried to shake down RFK Jr. for $25,000 to interview Thane Eugene Caesar, who recently died last year, who is the, the killer of RFK. It's beyond a reasonable doubt at this point, uh, based on the autopsy of Thomas Noguchi. And uh, Moldea became the deep state handler of Thane Eugene Caesar. You had to go through Moldea who was essentially on paper uh, a book author, you know, who had written books on Reagan, the mob, uh, obviously the, the Serhan book he had written about R the RFK assassination. Uh, he wrote one about uh, the OJ uh, affair. He was tied into a lot of police. He ends up being the handler of this guy, which you just, I, I wanna get the job as the handler because he ends up being actually, actually the godfather to the kids of uh, Thane Eugene Caesar. Uh, which we'll get into in a later episode. But getting back to um, to this particular case, uh, th there's a guy that I want to talk to you about. And his name is James Robinault. And Jam this is a guy here. James Robinault is the unofficial author of this book. And he is a guy who's written about four books on presidential, uh, on Woodrow Wilson. He wrote a book on Harding. Uh, this is him. He's a lawyer out of Chicago, right? So Dick. So this guy, Robinault, also writes, uh, well, Cleveland, I'm sorry, I don't know where the head office of the law firm is. <laughs> no, 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 I think that law yeah. firm he works with, the head office is in Chicago. That's why I'm mm. saying, you know, Chicago. He also is a contributor to the Washington Post and an obscure publication called the Daily Beast. Mm -hmm. So he writes for the Daily Beast, and I found this, this, this wonderful article that he wrote uh, for the Daily Beast. So I just want to share who this guy is. 
uh, before we get into a little bit more about him. He wrote this article, says if he loses, Trump must resign immediately and make Biden president. Right. So this is from 2020 from the election. And in this article, he is an expert on presidential uh, su succession and everything else. He writes that Trump is so hated and so despised by him personally. I mean, he goes on and on about Trump um, that if Biden wins the election, Trump has to resign on the next day after the election because the nation shut up. This is unbelievably insane. I, I got to post this article on locals afterwards. I, I read it last night. I had to read it like three times. He writes that Trump is so dangerous to the national security state. And this guy ought to know that he has to resign from office November 7th, the day after Election Day, and turn it over to Biden. So you go, well, how do you do that legally? He lays out in detail in this article how Pence resigns, Trump appoints Biden as vice president, and then Trump renders his resignation, making Biden the president on the next day after the election. In this article, he goes into great detail saying Trump has to do that and he will do it because he's a petulant child and he's going to lose by a landslide based on the polls. And because of that, he must resign the day after. And he wants Trump to read this so he will learn how to legally resign and turn the country over to Biden on November 7th because the country can't survive uh, until January 20th or especially January 6th, apparently. Maybe this guy was prescient about what was coming and Trump should have taken his advice. Because uh, this is written, this article is written in July 12, 2020. Um, oh. No, no, <laughs> way no, no. Oh, way ahead. So anyway, so this cat um, is the author of The Harding Affair, Love and Espionage During the Great War, uh, January 1973, Watergate, Roe versus Wade, Vietnam, and the month that changed America forever. And he's partners with a guy named John Dean, right? Okay. So he's hooked up with John Dean, and they run a seminar on Watergate, the two of them, on the legal aspects of Watergate. Why? I don't know. But I just want to tell you who his clients are, because this is a guy. What is that, Eric? The legacy of Watergate, his course. Oh, oh, right. Okay. So he teaches this course with, with the uh, fucko there, James Dean. <laughs> John Dean. <laughs> Nixon famous John Dean, guys. Yeah, Jackson, Nixon's John Dean. He, he teaches that course with him. And um, I guess he likes teaching it every single day of his life. Now you say to yourself, okay, where is this guy? What is he, an ambulance chaser? Why is this guy so popular? How does this guy get to write for the Daily Beast? How does he get to write this guy's book, uh, essentially? He claims, by the way, that the editor at their same publication, the same publishing house in Chicago that publishes his books, asked him to have a look at the galleys and make some notes, right? In the pre-order segment of Amazon, where the book is, where you pre-order uh, the book, it says in the description by the publisher that James Robinault helped Landis pro process his memories. Oh. Let, me re let me repeat what he said. That. <laughs> the book publisher says James Robinault helped Landis process his he memories. Hold on. Hold on. I'm not ready yet. Hold on. Now, I just want to get into that a little bit because... I want to tell you, he works for a corporation, a, a corporate law firm named Thompson Hine. And Barnes knows who Thompson Hine is. And this is for Robert. They represent and he represents the following brands and the following uh, clients. Chiquita Bananas out of, out of Costa Rica and Central America, Ford Motor Company, Duke Energy, Goodyear Tire mm. Rubber, Raytheon, Verizon, Pratt & Whitney Aircraft Engines for Defense Planes, Fortis Electric, which is an electric company for the Caribbean and Central America, and a, and a new client called Mission Essential to government contractors serving intelligence and military clients. This is who this deep state son of a bitch is. OK, this is the guy writing the book. People forget about fucking Paul Landis. He's meaningless. This is a deep state book. It's a deep state operation. He's the handler. His quote from from Robinault is, quote, um, Conspiracy hounds are legion. With his new book's publication, Landis can expect intense security uh, scrutiny. And here's a quote. I made myself available to him as a way of helping to prepare him for what was to come. 
quote unquote. This is from uh, Robinold. Now, Landis will never give an interview. He, the New York Times thing was an exclusive. This article in Vanity Fair is from Robinold. Uh, the Daily Beast thing is from Robinold. Everything is now going to be Robinold. He will be the Dan Moldea for Thane Eugene Caesar, which is why I mentioned that relationship. Moldea had a number of successful books. He ends up being the handler for Thane Eugene Caesar. This is the role that the deep state has assigned this guy, James Robinold. He will, I predict, be giving the interviews in the future, and the elderly man will die, and he will give no interviews. Now, I'm just getting back to what Eric was getting into. Here's a, I just want to give you this quote. This is from Robinold from the article in Vanity Fair, which I'm going to post um, on Locals. It's a new JFK assassination revelation. Could up it's already up there. Okay, great. Uh, here's a quote from his article. Over the decades, there have been endless theories surrounding the assassination, Eric, but not one of them, not one, ever considered that a Secret Service agent might have brought a fully intact bullet found on top of the rear seat of the limousine into Parkland Memorial Hospital and placed it on the president's stretcher. Not one. Hmm. None? None. Zero. Ever, he says. Are you sure? That's what he says. Okay. Okay. But then he told me something. It kind of is going to close the case on a 50-year-old mystery where the bullet C E 399 came from and how it got there. That's the bullet was on the, found on the stretcher at uh, Parkland Memorial Hospital. And Sam had found this while cleaning up the car and going through the presidential car. And he just picked it up laid it on that stretcher, never said a word. And then we got all done, you know, he says, uh, you, you can tell this stuff. And I said, okay, I'll tell it. If you want it out there, I'll tell it. He says, but I think you better wait until I die. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, I hope it isn't any time soon. I thought the 50th anniversary was a good time to, to tell this because he wanted it told. So wait, that was the fiftieth anniversary, right? Right. That was a that was a different uh, uh, Secret Service agent. He's referring to Sam Kinney, shown here in this in this little piece of tape by Eric. This is a guy named La Gary Lukes, who was his neighbor, who ten years ago came on and said that Sam Kinney told him. Sam Kinney died in nineteen ninety seven. By the way, also interviewed uh, a couple of times by Vince Palomaro, the legend. Uh, Gary Lukes is the voice you're hearing. He comes out and says that the 399, the pristine magic bullet, was found by Sam Kenny, uh, and he was the one that put it in the stretcher. Uh, so here to repeat, over the decades, there's been endless theories surrounding the assassination, but not one of them considered that a Secret Service agent might have brought a fully intact bullet found on the top rear of the limousine into Parkland Memorial Hospital and placed it on the president's stretcher, not one. Now it's two. Okay, so now we got Sam Kinney 10 years ago telling this cat, well, it wasn't 10 years ago. No, it was even before that. Because he, he died there. in 1997. The guy <laughs> doesn't say anything until the 50th anniversary. Now, this is a problem. This is a problem. I'll tell you why. Because if this book comes out, right, and this book says that Paul Landis, uh, with the book written by uh, Robinold, says Paul Landis found this bullet on the back of the seat, right? And this guy, Gary Lukes, says, wait a minute. I said this 10 years ago. Sam Kinney told me this. What the hell's going on here? That's trouble. Well, in February of this year, Gary Lukes mysteriously died with no cause of death, and he's Whoa. dead. Thank you, Hunley. You will listen and you will learn. <laughs> there is, dead men tell no tales. So I wow. have here the obituary of Gary Lee Lukes, who died in February of this particular year, a uh, couple of months before the book came out. Because having him out there, the other guy who just did that audio, is a big problem, Hunley. It's a big problem. And now... Because we just did this show. I, I, thank you very much. Let me look for <laughs> clicks on my phone line, damn it. No, we do, because we just did this show. This book and this story is into the shitter. That's why I wanted to do this show. Because Sam Kinney, now let me tell you about Sam Kinney, because Vince uh, uh, told me a bit about Sam Kinney. Sam Kinney is the driver 
of the car. If you show that Alchin's photo again, the the uh, the, the the Queen Mary, you know, the Cadillac, uh, the the famous Alchin, that one there. The driver there, right there, is Sam Kinney. Sam Kinney, uh, proud, not proudly, but unabashedly admitted that he was the one, not proudly, I mean, he's embarrassed about it, but he was the one that took the bubble top of his, on his own with no orders off the top of the car. Here they are putting it back on. But uh, Sam Kinney was the Secret Service agent who admitted um, with some courage that it was his decision and his decision alone to remove the bubble top. Uh, now, Bill Moyers claims the JF, uh, the LBJ aide who was who was doing advance work for LBJ and changed the parade route. Bill Moyers, who's never written an autobiography, although he's written other books. Uh, that is uh, Kenny. Is that Kenny on the left there? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay, they're putting it back on. So uh, Bill Moyers says that he ordered the removal of the bubble top, and and Vince Palomares famously said. You know, uh, having some press guy order the Secret Service around is absurd. It's a, they would never listen to him in a million years, is what Vince has said about this story by Moyers, which is a crock of shit. Uh, why Moyers would say it, why Moyers changed the parade route, why they did anything, you'd have to ask LBJ and his people about that. But uh, Sam Kinney, to his credit, always believed there was a conspiracy. Sam Kinney believed there were shots from the front. Sam Kinney uh, uh, believed that uh, uh, there might have been Grassy Knoll shooting and some other things from Sam Kinney. The point of the matter is Gary Lukes is making up this crock of shit story. This guy is the Robinault of 10 years ago. That's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> Gary Lukes is, is, is the original James Robinault. That's how they tried to do this thing 10 years ago. And that was a brief run at trying to pull it off 10 years ago. They then got uh, the 88-year-old uh, uh, Paul Landis to jump on board. And the reason you would jump on board, if you've had a life as a house painter, handyman, machine shop employee, and security guard, $200,000 in an advance on a book might be something that your grandchildren might want to have, right? Mm -hmm. It's a small lie, but like I said at the beginning of this episode, you need one lie to get the book deal in the JFK genre. Because other than that, you're just repeating stuff that's out there and you're not going to get a book deal. You have to break through the media uh, uh, cacophony, especially in this area, especially for the 60th. And this is what they've come up with. That he took this bullet and originally Sam Kinney took the bullet, but now Paul Landis has taken the bullet. Now let's take a look at what really happened because there's a guy named... Daryl Tomlinson. Now, Daryl Tomlinson was an orderly at Parkland Hospital. There's a, chain of, there's a chain of custody on the bullet. This is what the official record is. Uh, the original chain of custody is Tomlinson, who's an orderly, finds the bullet on a stretcher. And we don't know if it's, it's JFK. We don't think it's JFK stretcher. We don't know if it, it's definitely not JFK stretcher. We don't know if it's Connolly's or a random stretcher. That people believe it was a random stretcher against the men's room door. Not Connolly's nor JFK's. Okay. He's a Parkland maintenance guy. He was put in charge of running the elevator by the Secret Service. They said, don't let anybody up, control the freaking elevator. Okay. There's a guy named O.P. Wright, O.P. Wright. He's the chief of security at Parkland Hospital personnel. He is given the bullet by Daryl Tomlinson. We have a chain of custody that far. Okay. That O.P. Wright takes the bullet and gives it to Richard Johnson, the Secret Service agent who was who was stationed at the trademark, okay? Johnson wraps it up in his handkerchief, puts it in his pocket, and takes it on the jet to Washington, D.C., just like Paul Landis could have done. <laughs> He's no different than Paul Landis, and he gives it to the head of the Secret Service, James Rowley. James Rowley then turns it over to Elma Lee Todd at the FBI, and that's where the chain of custody goes crazy. Uh, he gives it to uh, Robert Frazier in the FBI lab at 730. Uh, these are initials on there. Elmer Lee Todd is not initialed on there. Robert Frazier's initials are on there. Charles Killian's initials are on there. And Cortland Cunningham's initials are on there. These are all FBI lab people 
who have their initials on there. The chain of custody is broken during FBI possession. It's a story for another day. Uh, but the the original custody, the original chain, uh, starts with Daryl Tomlinson. Uh, why he doesn't admit that for 60 years that he did this, according to uh, James Robinault, is he had PTSD and couldn't admit it because of the PTSD and didn't want to make trouble. Okay, that's the, that's their story. They're sticking to it. It's weak sauce, but that's all they have, Eric. Well, it's right? horrible weak sauce because you just said that he was in the um, counterfeit region, et cetera. That's no way to treat chain of custody. Right. It, it, it makes no sense. Where, now, a civilian would be stupid and they might pick it up and do something like that. But he wasn't a civilian. Right. He was a law enforcement officer with yeah, yeah, yeah. training. Yeah, yeah, There's yeah. There's no effing way I know. he would do that logically. Right. His story is he thought they'd find it with the body. Right. I'm going like that's his, that's how weak this is. He thought they instead of doing what Richard Johnson did, which was just logic, you wrap it up and take it with you to Washington. What is so freaking difficult about doing this? Because it didn't freaking happen. That's what's so freaking difficult. Now, you in the book, they begin to get into this, which is where they want to go in the book. This is just an entree into the storyline about the magic bullet, which is where they want to go. I have always felt partially, not completely, that 399 might have been the shallow back wound into Kennedy's upper right back that fell out uh, into the car from the shallow back wound as a pristine bullet and was underpacked with, with ammo and was an old war, war, World War II surplus bullet that did not traverse a bullet, a bullet went into his back three quarters of an inch or half an inch, half of a pinky, according to the doctors at Bethesda, and it fell out. Whatever went in there fell out. I have always suspected, now I'm not completely convinced, that 399 was that bullet. Now, 399 still would have been more damaged than this. 399, I've always said, looks like a bullet they fired from a Carcano into a tank of water to have a bullet linked to the Carcano. So I'm on a split thing with this deal, but uh, there is the theory that it was fired into a tank. There's very little damage on it. It looks like a water tank bullet fired uh, out of a Carcano to use it uh, in a framing device to whoever had the Carcano. However, a separate issue is what bullet went into the back of JFK that only went in a half an inch and where is that bullet? So that's a separate question, separate question. None of this is answered by Landis. But what they're trying to do in the book is show that Oswald and another shooter were involved. That's the goal of the book, to say, yes, this is a conspiracy. It's a limited hangout. It's Oswald plus another shooter. They're long gone. Forget about it. Move on. Touchdown. Move on to the next game. That's what they want to do. But if you want to get into the weeds about the magic bullet theory, it's not one that comes at, through Connolly. In fact, in another statement in the book, they believe, as you've heard from this orator right here, which is their position in the book, that Connolly was shot from above and behind with, with separate bullets, Eric, which is what I've discussed for a number of years. So that's in the book. There, there are some truths in this book that are fascinating, uh, but Paul Landis finding the magic bullet and putting it on the gurney, connecting him to the book, is not one of them. Uh, Robinault has his own agenda and is writing these long articles as if he wrote the book, which is, which is absolutely true. It's his project. So, um, you know, look, I mean, the chain of custody on 399 has been challenged. You might want to look at Destiny Betrayed, the Oliver Stone uh, uh, disc number two, where it gets into the chain of custody of the uh, 399 I'll post this report uh, by Landis that comes out. This is his statement, his initial statement, uh, which I have here about what he saw and what happened to him, um, about uh, him with Jackie Kennedy, basically. By the way, your favorite author, um, yeah. Handler, uh, this is his great grandfather and who ties him into politics, W.W. W. Um, Durbin. Yeah. That's his great great grandfather. Right, the guy that's right. apparently that's right. he um worked under Roosevelt yeah. and very interestingly was a magician 
and good about making money move around. So I you cannot. Oh, no, no, there, there can't be a guy more deep state than this guy. He has family lineage. It goes all the way back decades and decades and decades of presidential connections, administration connections. He is so well connected now, obviously, with this law firm that we talked about and deep state uh, Raytheon and those elements. I mean, this is a deep state operation, this book. Uh, and RFK Jr. should do a little bit more research before he issues these blanket statements. Um, here he is right there. He's mad at you, man. Oh, he's yeah. not going to be happy about this. Yeah, he, he looks like he's the only us right now. Well, I mean, <laughs> he has enough time to go with John Dean and to make these crazy, crazy anti-Trump articles on, on the Daily Beast. This guy is a full-time deep state apparatchik working for the Soviet task news service that we have these days called Media. And this book is part of that. Unfortunately, people, if this explanation helps anybody to understand, uh, by the way, uh, Luke uh, says that um, Sam K Kinney uh, also told him that uh, the suspect that he believed was involved was uh, LBJ. Later in that tape, he says uh, that Kinney also told him it was LBJ. <laughs> now, uh, now Vince has interviewed Kenny obviously a number of times. None of this ever came up, you know. Uh, but they said that he was ex-military uh, Gary Luke's, and that's why he's honest because he's oh. <laughs> he's ex-military and his neighbor next door because he was probably guarding the f out of him. All of these cats have handlers, as we saw in the Ruth Bain episode uh, in up Northern California, right, Eric? Mm -hmm. When she was up there uh, uh, doing, she had her handler. None of these people, if I attempted right now to get an interview, interview with Paul Landis, I would get a call from this guy saying, oh, yeah. how, can, how can I help you? That's the gig. That's the gig. So we know that we know the deal. Uh, it, this doesn't resolve the magic bullet problem. It doesn't resolve anything. What it does is it sells books for this guy and Paul Landis and gives Paul Landis money. Uh, and Paul Landis, as uh, as he says, Vince Palomara is an enigma who's gone both ways throughout the years, as has Clint Hill, who's been caught lying numerous times. Uh, the whole Clint Hill, you know, I jumped on the back of the car is fine, um, which he did. But Clint Hill has also altered his story numerous times over the years, as has Paul Landis. Uh, two sketchy dudes. Amazing. Amazing. If that helps anybody understand, I could get back to my life of working <laughs> on Soviet spies. Because well, you may be finding them. I know. No, I think I'm outing them already. I, I, I think we are finding them. There's, uh, you know, this, uh, of course, initially when the book came out, which is not out yet, by the way. Um, oh, I thought it came out today. October 10th, I think. Oh. No, it's a pre-order. Oh, we're cutting into this. Right. <laughs> I, I, I know he's favorite. going on a show tomorrow, by the way. Uh, Roman, yeah. I'll, I know what show he's going on. Oh, no, he's going to do the press, bro. Oh, yeah. uh, Landis was among the agents who went to the cellar where, as he mentioned in one of his 1963 statements to authorities, he had two or three salty dicks. Salty <laughs> dicks. I just want to say salty dicks, which was the house drink. A local concoction that might or might not have had alcohol. Um, it doesn't really say. Landis attested that he drank grapefruit juice, which he says today had no alcohol. Um, of course, before that, he said he drank these salty dicks and also um, uh, scotch at the press club. But anyway, he stays until five o'clock in the morning. I've never been in a club till five o'clock in the morning doing anything other than drinking salty dicks. Well, I've managed to avoid that. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so his, his um, uh, he was castigated for drinking alcohol that might impair him. If called upon in form of duty, this no, this no, this no doubt contributed to his overall reluctance to come forward, according to Robinolf. I mean, that's they're trying to explain. Okay, the first thing you have to do with these articles is explain, and it, it's I'm, as a journalist, as a writer of these magazine articles, my whole life, the first thing you have to do is get into how physically fit. The 90-year-old Paul Landis is mentally and physically. You have to establish right out of the gate that the guy is just a spry. incredible. Not, no, beyond spry. He goes into detail here. 
He's playing golf every day. He swims. Uh, he, no, 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 no. <laughs> because you have to have the ability to write a 300 page book at the age of 90 when you've been a security guard. You have to have the mental acuity, Eric. What what ninety year old has the mental acuity? He's never even read the freaking Warren report. Okay, so the book has a bunch of photos of him with Jackie, and it's the same as Clint Hill's book. Um, you know, you put in your family photos that you got, and you got yourself a book, right? Mm -hmm. I'll just say this: Landis to this day attests that in the first few years following the assassination, he was simply unable to overcome his PTSD from witnessing the murder firsthand. Uh, he also felt unable to read anything, anything in detail about the assassination until 50 years later, starting in 2014, when he began to come to grips with all that he had witnessed, uh, suppressed and finally processed in 2014. Unfortunately, the Kennedy detail show and book was in 2010. So <laughs> he's, off, he's off by four years, even in that uh, feeble uh, explanation of uh, the PTSD of Paul Landis. Well, maybe Seth, can, uh, maybe uh, they stole his bullet story and he had to wait another 10 years. <laughs> well, I, I mean, all, all I know is Luke's ain't around to dispute it anymore. That's all I can tell you. Nope. All right, I'm going to take a leak and come right back. So just put up some super <laughs> chats and we'll get into it. <laughs> all right. Al Bowman, best show around. Thanks, guys. The truth still matters. Thank you very much, Al Bowman. I'm going to put up some Mia's dad from Australia. $2. Thank you. Michael Behan, uh, two euros, it looks like. Thank you very much. And let's see. Uh, I don't know that you're going to find a recipe for a salty get dick um, Pete's Guide. Uh, I'm afraid to read what it might be. It, it seems like a sketch club to to be certain. Um, Bob Bennett, just keep doing what we're doing. We definitely will keep doing what we're doing. Thank you very much. And I saved uh, a big one here for you, Mark. Um, Booker Dog. What is that I'm saying? amazed. I'm amazed at how many comments I see saying they listen to your episodes multiple times. Hmm. I find something new every time I listen. You guys are the best. Mark should have been a history professor. I would have been in trouble with the female students. I would have been removed within a year. <laughs> okay. Well, Dustin wants to know if he's a hand model, but was he a master of his domain? You know, that's the only reference I have, Dustin. By the way, thanks for your uh, uh, book fund donation from Dustin Russell, by the way. The, um, the only reference that I have is Seinfeld with George Costanza becomes a hand model. I mean, I don't know anybody. If there's somebody out there who's a hand model, please let me know. Because the only thing I reference I have is what Dustin is saying about. Um, I know uh, it's a thing, but it's, no, it's obviously a real thing. But I mean, how does a Secret Service agent become a hand model and live in, in, in Columbus, Ohio, for Christ's sake? He had delicate digits. Mm hmm. Um, Dustin Russell again in the words of Mark Robert this book is a crock of shit thank you Dustin uh, it's going to sell a lot of books they're going to the mat on this one bro apparently they're going and to the mat this is a big time operation Phyllis Hall is she a credible witness just read an article on her and her evidence on the stretcher bullet I've never heard her name I don't know anything about her so I don't know who out. she is I've never heard her name in the uh, in the genre all right now uh, folks um uh, because this is not enough to be a full-blown episode, we're going to take a few questions, you know, Q&A questions. Um, and if you don't mind, please say question and let us know. Let me look at Well, one see more if you could question, at least try to keep the questions about this particular breaking news. That would be nice. That would be it, nice. And different. try to stay try to stay focused. I know you people are on medication. I know oh, a lot of you are drunk, and some of hold you. Hold on, this is okay though. You can be distracted with a hundred dollars. I won't complain. From uh, McAllen, Texas, buy more books. Love you guys. Listen, Thank everything, you. Everything starts in Texas. I'll tell you that right now with this assassination. <laughs> yeah, and it seems like it's staying there. Uh, Pasha said, "I'm swamped with details today, and that's a good thing." Yeah, I have more, but I just didn't want to bury people. I mean, there's more to this. I mean, like I said. Um, 
this is a breaking news story. I'm trying to get my get around it, you know, as quickly as possible with breaking news here. Yeah, no, totally agree. Uh, let's see what we have on locals. Uh, oh, a lot of stuff going on on locals. So, hold on. Epic show from Grapes. Thank you. I was looking for a question here. Da, 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 da. Um, oh, come on. I swear I saw a question. Uh, Nurse Aubrey Bell in 2013 video interview talked about seeing a bullet on the JFK stretcher right after he was brought in. Are that's true. That, no, no, that's true. She's also one who talked about the book, the pencil side bullet hole in the windshield, uh, the same nurse uh, oh. who, who now is a doctor. And she was a nurse at Parkland or a student nurse at the time. She was one of the witnesses who uh, uh, went into detail explaining the windshield bullet hole in the front windshield people. Anyone who thinks that this story's not real needs to see the interview with her and look at the photos. You could see the Alchins photo where the close up is the beveled uh, shot that came through the, the top of the windshield, uh, the very top where it hits the metal. Okay. Um, this really isn't related to it. It's a locals tip, though. Hey, how about that slumlord and rum runner Joe Kennedy? Did he run guns too? I don't know anything about that. I, I really yeah, don't. Sure. I, I don't think the guy needed to be a rum runner to make money. I, it sounds like asking some multimillionaire to sell grams of cocaine in a in a bathroom bar. You know what I mean? I, it's just what I, I've always felt it's way out of proportion with what they're accusing him of. Hmm. All right. Uh, let's see some questions here. Well, Pamela's saying hello, guys. Hey, Pamela. We got to meet Pamela at the meetup. Oh yeah, she was great. Um, T Dog, question: What happened to the medical examination of Connolly? Would he not have been hit multiple times? He was. I, I believe he was hit multiple times. I believe the the bullet that went through him came from the roof uh, of the Texas School Book Depository, and I believe there was a rifle up there, and I believe there was a man up there, and I believe that that man, as is kind of described in this book, apparently that Connolly was shot from up above and from behind. And uh, that leaves, based on the angle of the shot that went through his back, coming out his chest, going through his right wrist and ending up in his left leg, that gives a little angle that it's not a straight down shot on Connolly, but uh, above and to the left of Connolly and the angle of it. And I've said this for years and years, and nobody's ever really picked up on it. Maybe if we go to Dallas, we could talk about it in Dallas. Um, but I've always felt that he was shot separately and from the roof and straight down. All right. Um, Chris Duncan, who gave testimony about a second bullet found in the limousine that was of a different caliber with a point that disappeared? I guess it's the person who disappeared or the... There was shrapnel all through the limousine. As, as Kellerman famously said, it was raining a fuselage of bullets down upon us that day. Uh, Kellerman testified to that. There's shrapnel all through the car. Just so people know... Um, when you're saying bullets, there are pieces of shrapnel all over the place. Some people believe that it was a flange kind of uh, type of bullet that entered the front of his throat and left medical particles uh, that are apparently on the x-ray of his throat throughout his neck and lower throat, and that it was a, a explode, like a flange or, or a bullet that fragments, let me just put it that way, the throat bullet, because that's never found. You know, where is the bullet that goes through the windshield? You know, there's metal everywhere in the car. And and and, and Barrett, the FBI agent, you know, picks up a, a bullet that's on the grass and he flies that back to uh, uh, FBI headquarters in Quantico. So that's a separate bullet that Barrett picks up. But there's there are pieces of material. Now, Sam Kinney also famously said that he had a huge chunk of JFK's skull uh, that looked like a ceramic pottery piece that was like six inches and he put that in his pocket uh, according to sam kinney and turned that over to the doctor so i don't know uh there's a little bit more about sam kinney and and blood and guts that's a separate epi separate issue yeah for sure um beavis wallace again from mccallan texas huge oh, they're coming in hot What's going on in McAllen, Texas, bro? What's the deal? I don't down know. There? I like what they're drinking, though. Um, what are they? They're drinking that moonshine down there. That's what they're drinking. White lightning. 
Maybe what reward did Connolly get from LBJ for being shot multiple times? Well, okay, so uh, the governor of Texas gets to run the state of Texas, and he also gets to become the secretary of the treasury under Nixon when he switches parties as a good egg and gets to get us off of the gold standard uh, completely under Nixon and then leaves. So, I mean, there's all, and then he's involved in, in, in all kinds of defense contracts, uh, all kinds of treasury things when he becomes secretary of the treasury. Uh, Connolly becomes a, a war hero of sorts and he's unbeatable politically. He's untouchable politically. And he it becomes a a victim or a war hero is the closest thing I can I can explain it as uh, politically and emotionally. Yeah, he's a living martyr. A living martyr. A living martyr. That'd be a good good reference. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you can't beat them. By the way, folks, the super chats really do help. I don't know why. I'm going to appeal it, but this show was demonetized about five minutes in. Oh yeah. Well, we're touching on this. They're not going to let us go. Well, they're I mean, okay, they got the little infographic they'll stick on yeah, it. Like they they're, always do. they're not gonna let us go, honey. Uh, you know uh, what would help if we if we heard maybe the bell of justice for subscriptions? Yeah, somebody pointed out that we've been dropping the ball on that. Yeah, and, we need to focus on subs so they can't kill us. You know what I mean? Yes, please. And uh that goes I mean, with we, the bell. We, 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 if you have the bell or you don't hear the bell, the bell indicates it's time to subscribe. If you're an invalid in a nursing home, you're in an iron lung. We understand there's problems, but if you have a nurse, maybe the nurse could come over and help you to subscribe. If you're 100 years old and mummified and don't have fingers, uh, well, maybe there's other ways you could get to that uh, button. I'm not sure. Or Paul Landis can subscribe. Paul Landis can subscribe. He's healthy. Sure. He's going to be in the Senior Olympics in uh, Japan. I think so. Uh, got some locals here. Great podcast, Eric Cumley, and that Mark Robert adds some to the show, too. Right on, brother. Um Entry required, uh, sent a follow-up saying, do you have any idea how drunk I am right now? Who is that, one of the uh, followers? Uh, yeah, one of the commenters who was asking oh, yeah. about rum yeah. runner Joe Kennedy. I'm like, maybe yeah. that's why you're thinking rum. Right, could be. Uh, Karen Toff said, are the Carrot Car Top? Karen Toff, or <laughs> Karan Toff. I said Carrot Top. And he's saying, are, are the... Um, well, I'm thinking salty dicks circumcised. Are they kosher? GF you know, wants to know. I, I don't know. All I know is that uh, George Carlin told me uh, he was performing there that night, and um, he worked at a local radio station out of Fort Worth at the time and was doing his famous Kennedy impersonation, and he scared the shit out of the Secret Service agents who thought that Kennedy came into the club. One of the great stories Carlin ever told me. Uh, just fantastic. Cool. Uh, Jim Penagas sent a link to an interview with um, Nurse Phyllis Hall on YouTube mm -hmm. that he's saying is extremely compelling. So that's okay. very helpful. I'm going to drop that in the YouTube comments so people can check it out too if they want. I haven't seen it. Um, question, why is the deep state still working on the cover-up? No one who looks at the story really believes in the magic bullet or the lone gunman. That's why. Well, well it, it's not true at all. They've been moving the needle from 80% of America believes it was a conspiracy. Now it's down to 59%. They are trying to get the American people off the track that the CIA killed them. And that's worthy for the CIA to not have the American people believe that, that uh, as RFK Jr. said, killed his father and his uncle. Uh, that, that's, you know. You can assign some men to do that every year, especially with the 60th anniversary. You know, there's people watching this show right now from Langley, Virginia. Uh, there are people assigned to watch this at a Langley, Virginia. There's a hundred CIA operatives in a room that just do Wikipedia people. I mean, you have to understand that this is their goal is at least to get this attention off of them. You know, Mammoth's coming out with another mob killed Kennedy movie. They have tried to move this needle or actually light off of them uh, onto other areas, whether it's Castro, the Soviets, uh, or the mob, mostly those three areas. Yep, uh, good. Uh, Barb Arian, uh, let me see. Question, what about the cop who replaced JFK body for autopsy? None you about Officer Tippett is no man? Probably. Probably. Uh, that didn't really happen, but... 
you may want do we have a tippet episode or something we have we have a tippet episode i've released some shorts on it but essentially tippet was killed but he was not swapped he wasn't <laughs> flown to bethesda right right but, um, that's an that's but, an urban urban myth but but there is involvement in his death with the overall assassination. Oh yeah 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 no 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 doubt about it. They just didn't need that extra body on the plane. <laughs> Everybody's going to go. What's that? Oh, that's Tippett. We're bringing him back to Bethesda. Now, if you flew him on Air Force Two, that's another problem because you know first of all, why bother? You've got Bethesda body after body after body after body. It's a naval uh, training hospital with tons of corpses everywhere. You don't need Tippett. Just to put an end to this Tippett speculation that he had a hairdo that looked like Kennedy, you didn't need Tippett to pull this off. Just keep it in mind. You don't need Tippett. Right. Um, question. Is the Michael Payne prescient at the RFK... Oh, is a Michael Payne present at the RFK shooting the husband of Ruth? Payne's a pretty common name. I don't know. I, I don't know. You're saying that Michael Payne was in the Ambassador Hotel? Or there was a, maybe they're saying a Michael Payne was there, which is possible, not necessarily the same person. Payne's pretty common. I, I, Michael, I, I, too. I don't know about Michael Payne uh, being common, but um, I don't know that he was at the Ambassador Hotel either, so I really can't answer that. Right. And um, let me see. Question. Has Ruth Payne ever took a polygraph test? I probably. I, I, I doubt it. I well, doubt she was it. CIA. She probably did. Because I, I, they oh, oh, oh I see. Right. You're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't mean you'll see it. <laughs> right, right. Good point. Well, so was her sister. Her sister administered them. She was a mm -hmm. psychologist at Langley, her own sister. For the yeah. love of God. And then her father was USAID and blah, blah, blah. But, you know. All right. Um, question. How many bullets were recovered, not including 399? Well, just 399. The rest are, are shells up in the uh, school book depository. The bullet that Barrett recovers is a bullet. That's the one in the grass you know, that uh, is flown also to uh, Quantico. And uh, the rest are pieces of bullets, or you know, or fragments. Right. But no. the one, that, the 399 is just pristine. It's like, it looks to be fired into a tank of water. And only law enforcement could, re or, or whoever, could have that set up where you fire the bullet into the tank. There's been demonstrations on YouTube, if you want to see what a bullet comes out fired into a tank of water, it can be very similar to 399. All right. Um, do you think Landis or Hill or any others were set up uh, for blackmail the night before at Ruby's, I guess? Well, I don't know if they're set up for blackmail, but I, I think they were set up and lost their guns and lost their badges uh, as per the Secret Service who admitted it and then recalled all of the um, official, excuse me, Treasury badges and reissued them with a different uh, cover on the badge itself. So they admitted they were lost. They admitted a couple of them lost their guns. They admitted that they were shit faced. They admitted that they violated the laws against drinking while on duty. They admitted they uh, came to the uh, assassination day uh, hungover. I mean, how much more do you need? You know, you don't need to do blackmail. The damage of having these hungover, uh, wasted Secret Service agents and having their badges uh, taken. Now, keep in mind, people, they were people running around flashing Secret Service IDs on the, on the knoll and in back of the Texas School Book Depository. So, yeah, it could be invaluable to have those IDs the night before. But keep in mind, the people who who printed them, um, the CIA was involved in the printing of those IDs in general. So uh, that could be easily printed by the CIA. All right. Um, question, non-money bearing question. Will there ever be an AUS coloring book? You know, I think a Kennedy coloring book might be something we could talk to Ziggy about later when she gets done with these cards, because I always wanted to have a, a, a child's coloring book about the assassination. I know it sounds a little macabre, but I think it would be good for uh, kids to be able to color that, and adults would like it too. Hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> see, kittens, in awe and gratitude for this history, the extra $5 is for Mark's lapels. Yeah, thank you, baby. Uh, question, what more would have been gleaned if Connolly had an autopsy? You mean if his wife had agreed to exhume the body? Yeah, I mean, you could take out the shrapnel out of his body and weigh it and see 
that Good it's point. not it's more than 399's entire bullet that's the way you get rid of 399 is simply and she refused to have the body exhumed all you have to do is extract the metal from the man's body and add it on to 399 and you'll see that there's more than this missing from 399 it's another achilles heel of the assassination all right and um and don't forget our inspector who comes up with this theory he's awarded with the senator of pennsylvania for life award and not to be confused with regina specter the great singer out of new york the russian doll face that i saw at uh, the greek theater last month this is arl inspector the <laughs> creator of the magic bullet theory okay <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let me go back to locals for a second. Question, a little off topic. I heard on a 9-11 documentary yesterday that the Kennedy White House photographer kept his photos in one of the Twin Towers and got destroyed. Is I, this I, correct? I highly doubt that. I mean, there's copies of these photos at the Kennedy Library and everything else. Um, I don't know about that. And Pasha sent a um, picture of a pup. He's wearing pajamas, or essentially. Who? who? Asha Moyer. No, no, a, a picture of who? Of a dog mm -hmm. wearing, like, shark pajamas. I, I don't know how to describe it, but anyway, he's saying, trying to stay on topic, the puppy had knee surgery and is wearing the shirt to keep her from chewing on her stitches. Could we use the same method to help the deep state authors from chewing on this cover-up? Uh, okay. Man, that's an abstract. I'm going to have to take some more acid to understand this. <laughs> yes, but I, I have not taken enough acid. And it's, it's tough without the visual, Pasha. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, but yeah. Um, let's see. Entry required said, question, Eric and Mark. Mark, you for some reason feel akin to Forrest Gump. I think you are of you. Not akin to Forrest Gump. What does that have to do with Forrest Gump? Some sort of fictional Southern character? Yeah, no, uh, well, we've said, called you the Forrest Gump of pop culture. But anyway, um, I think of you more akin to Zelig. Could you ponder this for a moment? Well, Zelig is um, a movie by Woody Allen where a guy has a chemical or some sort of psychological problem where he becomes, uh, e even a Chinese man, he becomes, uh, who's ever standing next to them like a chameleon, he becomes part of their uh, look and... Um, uh, profession. I mean, it's an interesting idea. It doesn't really hold up. I watched it a, a month ago or two, and it, when it came out, I thought it was brilliant. But it, over time, it, it kind of it's a one note joke that doesn't really hold up over time. Is my Zelig mini review. All right. Um, hey, we've got. Uh, let's see. I heart PG on Rumble Rant. Thanks for setting us straight. And Clint Hill, Paul Landis is the Biden, I guess it's Biden, it says Binden, but I think maybe Biden, of Secret Service. This is elder abuse. Choked on my drink when you said salty dicks times three. Say it again. <laughs> salty dicks. That's what they drank there. Salty dicks. Who am I to say? I don't know what's in a salty dick. It just sounds like some sort of, you know, liquor concoction that's pretty strong. Yeah, uh, yeah kind of does. Right. A Walfer on Rumble Rant. Question. Mark, does the fact that this ghost author has family ties to politics and the deep state confirm your assertions in the CIA family ties episodes? Oh. Yeah. No, no, it does. I mean, because <laughs> sure. he, he, they like to work with, they don't like to work with rogue lone people. You know, that's sketchy. They, if they do take a person, they take them from an orphanage and they build them from the ground up. Look at the Dick Carlson episode to see what I am I'm talking about. Other than that, the other alternative of taking him from an orphanage is uh, someone with deep family ties going back deeply into American family political tradition. By the way, it's not that different than terrorist cells. I hate to tell you. Or, or other countries. The, the, the Soviets did the same thing. It's not yeah. an American thing. I mean, most countries do that. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I mean, the terror cells, it's like they have to know you. You have to be, they have to know the cousin or whatever. People don't just walk in and say, hey, I'm a new recruit. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Um, okay, I already, we already answered this, but um, thank you for a second super chat about Landis and Hill being set up. Uh, question, your opinion of six seconds in Dallas. 
You know, I was just looking at it again last night. Uh, there's some interesting stuff and there's some inaccuracies. It's a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag. You know, um, you know, one of the OG books, obviously, um, by Josiah Thompson. Uh, you, you have to have it in your arsenal or, or library, I think. But is it deliberate inaccuracies? Because I feel like some of them have a deliberate oh, yeah, that, 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 versus... that I, don't, I, I don't know because he it, it, it was um serialized in either look i want to say look magazine uh, which was a poor man's version of life um and there were there were photos and there was inaccuracies in those but i don't know i don't know to be honest with you okay um dan dolphin why do i feel the mainstream media has not highlighted the latest revelation about this elderly former cia's confession of planting and leaving this pristine bullet on JFK stretcher and not Connolly's. Um, well, you got multiple questions in there, but I guess it's a self-answering question, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, any <laughs> Sergeant Willing, cute. Any truth that Dorothy Kilgallen was a raving drunk? You know, the night I was with her and we had, I don't know, some kind of sex. It, it, she said she wasn't drunk, and I said she was. We got into a fight. She got into a cab, and I don't know what happened to her after that. Hmm. Okay. We'll, we'll look out for her her story. <laughs> All right, Beavis Wallace again. What I am hell? drinking a Vesper Martini. Wow. I have some uh, border stories for you. I'm a foot doctor and work two blocks from two huge hotels that illegals stay at. Several buses pick them up at midnight and send them to the airport. FYI, buy books, Mark. Yeah, no, I also have a question about my bone spur, uh, Dr. Wallace, if you can contact Hunley, and I have a couple of questions, whether I should get it shaved or have the big toe surgery. You know what I'm talking about? He knows. Okay. Wallace uh, knows. I want to hear from I, Dr. I'll Wallace. I'll pass that email pass right it on to you. Wallace. I want to know about the bone spur shaving surgery. EricHunley.com slash contact. Right. I'll All get right. to the bottom of this. Get, mm -hmm. And then I'll come down to the border because my foot will be better. I can make a run for it down there. All right, uh, RMB1213, great show, guys. Thank you. Let me see. <laughs> Cute. Sir Lawrence, never heard of a JFK fellow, but I'm in East Palestine, Ohio. Any chance you guys have the next meetup here? Just a heads up, train service can be spotty. That's so, funny. How's the, how's the water? I mean, uh, what do you uh, drink when we get there? Yeah, good point. Uh, Steve Brunner, question. Can he be charged with obstruction of justice? enforce truth and help in this kind of bs well it's funny because he mentions that he was afraid um of, of, they're trying to come up with reasons he didn't come forward for 60 years and one of them was not, not criminal but he felt that um he would be ostracized or criticized or you know laid into for waiting 60 years to come out with this story and each year it got worse and worse until he gave up i, I mean it's a the whole thing's a crock of shit. You know, it doesn't even matter. I mean, but you're right. It, it, it could be either he's lying or it's obstruction of justice. You can't have it both ways. Yep. Uh, let me see. Very interesting, but I don't have anything to add. I just wanted to help. You know, Beverly, you, Beverly. Beverly has been a supporter of us since the beginning. And uh, yeah. I, I appreciate her support. I, I do as well. Um, we got some help here, though. Tony Gems, a salty dick. Is ever clear? Yeah, no, no, right. Juice. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And this guy knows, and and that's why I was joking around about it. He served ever clear down there, and uh, that's why the Secret Service went there. And that's a salty dick. He admitted to having two of these. I mean, that's so powerful. He already had scotch. I mean, if he says two, we probably had twenty-two. You know, what I mean, the guy was blind by the time he got to the assassination site. Well, if he was a kind of slight guy anyway, to two would be enough themselves to knock him on his ass potentially. Right. Okay. Well, it's it, look. It's white lightning. This is not gin. Yeah, that's what oh, I'm no, saying. No, I, <laughs> I, I and he'd already been drinking all night. Yeah. Um, let me see. Was umbrella? Right, well, I just want to interject one thing: that Clint Hill did not go out drinking with him that night, and either did, either did Kellerman. Other guys did not go out. Emery oh. Roberts did not go out. It was not uh, all of them. It was just nine. Okay. Okay. Um, was Umbrella Man and the Cuban a signal guy for the shooters never brought is an excuse for being there? I, I never bought into this stuff. I don't think it was necessary to have a guy with an umbrella to do a, a telescopic uh, or a, a shooting of that level. I don't think you, you need the umbrella guy to do that. I mean, you know, 
just my opinion. It's just my opinion. I, I never thought it was necessary. If, if snipers, if there are snipers out there, and there are, because we have so many commenters, please explain to me why you need an umbrella man in general for any sniping uh, uh, setup. All right. Um, if that, that, that helps. I mean, if that's a real question, if somebody's a sniper, ex-military can answer that. Do you need a, a guy who's a spotter on the ground? It sounds insane. Why would you need a spotter on the ground? Yeah, well, not from the grassy knoll. No, no, but I'm yeah, saying yeah, in, in yeah. a military environment, how would you get the spotter into yeah. a military thing that you're you're up on this on a building? Why would you have a guy? I mean, you could have a guy next to you with, with binoculars. Right, that, that's a normal spotter. Is who's next right, to you but, and, but that's not what Umbrella Man is. Umbrella right. Man, according to the believers, is a spotter on the ground. I, and I've never believed that's a real thing. Yeah, that, if if thinking in terms of a mission, a mission commander possibly. But why? But that's, why? But, you know, I, I agree with that. I'm just yeah. saying that it could a spotter would make no sense whatsoever. Right. Um, let me see. Um, question: I'm not sure you did more acid than me in New York State. There's a contact thing in a rainstorm with three sheets. There's a contact thing in a rainstorm. This is um. <laughs> That's tricky. I don't know if he's yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. But uh, Grape said, "Question: I thought it was Mark Kilgallen Grobert." Oh, she was my mother. You're right. From a, the first marriage, and then she got divorced. Okay, well, but she's my biological mother. As long as we cleared that up, uh, yeah. Rumble Rant. Uh, were there were any bullet pieces that hit James Togue down by the underpass ever found? Uh, no. In fact, he's hit by concrete from a, a bullet that even the Warren Commission admits uh, went astray, hits a piece of concrete, and then hits him in the face. So I don't, I don't, I don't think they ever found any uh, remnants of that. Hmm. Okay. But that's, um, a, that's a, even by their crazy theory, is an extra bullet. That's yeah, like, point. right. And if it, that's got to be one of the three shells that's, that's from the, the phony sniper's nest up in the school book depository where they lay down the three shells parallel to each other on the ground going, hey, look at me. I've got three shells here. Let's go. All right. Uh, he's claiming Umbrella Man used to distract Secret Service, except they were looking except there was no Except there was no Secret Service other than those in the vehicle. So there's yeah. no Secret Service on the ground. Yeah. Let me see. Alex Davy Duke, who we met in Las Vegas. Oh, from Canada. Right. Oh, right. Uh, some offset from demonetizing. You guys are great. Thank oh, you. Oh, that'll that'll help. It, that all, it all does. CA means California money. Canada. Oh, Canada, right. <laughs> the hat. Um, Joy B. Please do next week on the Maui fires and nah, laser nah, or nah, micro right. satellites. That's not, that's not our thing. Nah, that's call me call me bastard. Oh, yeah, that's not our thing, bro. We yeah, they've been avoiding us. We the don't do bastards those have been stories. avoiding us for we don't two do weeks. That. We don't do that stuff. But we're coming for. Them. We're not the new. We're not the local news. Uh, let me see. Was Roger Stone's book on JFK a useful reference? Yeah, it's it's a cliff notes of other books. I find the cliff notes of of uh, a play or of a, of a book because he he's just taking from all the uh, work that's out there, putting it into a shorter high school edition, simplified version of. So Philip uh, Nelson's mastermind in the assassination is the, and Robert you know, Caro and other sure. stuff. You know, it's all smushed together. A uh, bloody treason by Noel Twynan uh, is in there, and it's a shorthand Cliff Notes version of the masterworks of these master men. You know, who are the real deals? But it's not bad, right? It, I mean, it's it, like I said, it's like the Reader's Digest condensed version of a book. Yep, and he signed it for me, so. <laughs> oh, so he's plugging it right now. He's, he feels like right, brother, there you go. Uh, David Parsons, check into Frank Hamer. He was Coke Stevenson's man to go to to go after um, LBJ. He also killed Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, Frank Hamer, I think, was also um, almost killed by Bonnie and Clyde themselves um, earlier. He had an agenda, Frank Hamer, and he did eventually get them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a Texas Ranger, I presume, right? I think so. I yeah. think so. Uh, Dark Man had a radio for confirmation of kill. Um, I, I don't think you really needed a confirmation because you, all you had to do was go to Parkland and know that he was dead. I mean, I, I, again, think these things through. They don't make any sense. 
if you think him through. Be, he's dead by <laughs> by one o'clock. So, I mean, what confirmation do you need? Are you going to keep shooting or, or he's, the car's already gone? Perfect. Well, that that wraps up the chats and um, Oswald gets to make an appearance. What do we have coming up? Free form like Friday. I'm gonna tell, like I'm going to tell you. Oh, no. We have free form Friday. Right. 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 <laughs> I think you're gonna tell me. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean Tuesdays. Best. Tuesdays we're going back into KGB Soviet American mm. KGB American communist spies. Um, famously, more uh, to give some light on Whitaker Chambers and Alger Hiss and Nixon and some stuff like that on Tuesday. And this uh, may be turning into a multi-part thing, like the CIA yeah. has, you know, four parts. This is this could well, turn it, into three, it, it four. Leads up, this is pre-Rosenberg, so I'm actually going backwards. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it, it is interesting. We'll go back and forth, but this is going to be a little bit before how we get to the Rosenbergs. Yep, and I'm definitely looking forward to that. Hold on. What about the bell? What? Yes, absolutely. Please, please consider. We just crossed uh, today mm -hmm. ninety-seven thousand. Okay, we need three thousand stinking people somewhere in this universe. There's got to be three thousand people somewhere willing to freely, without any money, subscribe to the channel. I mean, give me a break. How hard is this to do, Hunley? I don't know. I, I mean, know. if if if, if Paul Landers could subscribe. That would give us two nine nine nine, and we get this mutt. What's his name? Robinault. We'd have two nine nine eight. Well, and if we could get the rest of the CIA, you know, like oh, that in the room, yeah. that's another hundred or so. So you know, right. hey, uh, please subscribe so you can keep an eye on us and what we're doing and track whatever we're saying if you want to donate to the book fund you can help me get these spy books which i've now bought a ton of but i thank everyone hold on let me i just want to see if i can find someone here this is to give a shout out to uh somebody here who just oh gavin newsom's donating to me it looks like that's interesting gavin newsom wants me to donate to his um constitutional amendment to get rid of uh, guns in california i see yeah, I think I'm going to pass on that one. But uh, hold on, let's see here. Maybe you can move to New Mexico. <laughs> uh, uh, Christina Hill, I want to thank. Mm -hmm. I want to thank Will Harper, uh, Sean Patterson, Heather Rose, uh, Ellen Haggerty. These people know who they are. I, I really want to thank all of you. Um, uh, Kevin Kirsten's. Uh, for donating to the book fund because this allows me to get these uh, rare books and then even with the PDFs that only finds uh, he could put up the PDFs which we tend to just dig out of the internet more than anything else you know or get from what's his name Rob Morrow down in Austin who's sitting on more PDFs uh, in Kennedy than any man on the earth um, really? so he's yeah 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 he 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 has given me a lot of PDFs over the years I don't know how he gets them, but he is a maven at getting PDFs of book Kennedy type books. I I still have quite a few. Yeah, uh, that's I'm good still to know. I'm yeah I'm still I still have a lot. Um, and then a shout out to Vince Palom Palomara, who for uh, sure Survivors Guilt. Please get his book. It is the definitive book on the JFK assassination regarding the Secret Service. Uh, everything you want to know about the Secret Service. And JFK is in Survivor's Guilt by Vince, uh, one of the seminal books on the assassination. I also put a link to his channel while we are going um, in the description on YouTube. So check out his channel. It, it does help. Mm -hmm. uh, Beavis Wallace from McAllen, Texas. I'll shave your spur live on the show. That's worth 3,000 subscribers. Oh, you know what? That might work, <laughs> dude. Well, if we go down to Dallas, maybe I could see this guy get and kill kill two birds with one stone. Get my spur shaved and do a conference or so down there for the twenty second. Are we looking to go down to Dallas or not? It depends. It depends on what we bring to the table because those guys who go to the conference uh, have a specific niche that they're talking about, Eric, mm -hmm. and our niche may not be fully developed by then. So. It depends where it is in terms of our niche of what we can bring to that table. It, it's okay. not a Q&A show, Eric. We just can't sit there 
and 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 mm. talk. You know, they want you to present stuff like it's a seminar. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, we could say the history of Paul Landis. <laughs> well, that's that's you know Vince Vince has that Vince. Oh, that yeah yeah. Well, uh, uh, no, technically. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, Big Saxaholics DCS Adventures. Louis Stephen Witt came forward to the United States House Select Committee on Assassinations in 1978, identifying yeah, himself as right. the Umbrella Man. And he said it was a protest against uh, um, the rum runner, Joseph Kennedy, and the British, some British thing. Yeah, there it is. Jo Joseph says support for Neville Chamberlain. That's right. Yeah. I was a little bit ahead of the, on that one, but... Um, well, uh, since it was there, it's like, let me bring it up. <laughs> oh, oh I, yeah. No, that was what he said before the House Assassinations Committee. All right. Um, what is the true story as to why Jackie is climbing over the limo? I've heard conflicting stories. Uh, grab a to... piece of his scalp, which she gets a scalp and brain, and then turns it over to the doctor at Parkland. She grabbed it. That's what she was going for. Lenny Bruce said she was hauling ass. That's not really true. There was a part of his scalp that was on the back of the uh, of the limo. It was going to fall off, and she was grabbing at that. All right. Um, did the new bullet sub the amount in Connolly? No, the the weight the the weight of of yeah. shrapnel in Connolly outweighs what's missing from three ninety nine. It would be great to physically have it, but you can in the X rays you can actually see what's in there and that it outweighs what's in the not even close what's missing from three. There's nothing missing from three ninety nine. I can there see there is a little bit of stuff missing, but it, it, yeah. it was shot into a water tank, bro. That's shot into a water tank. Yeah, it's not crazy. it's not deformed at all. Amazing. Uh, let me see. Rumble rant. Do you believe uh, three bullets hit JFK, one hit JP, JBC, and two shots missed completely? Do I believe there's a shot in the throat, shot in the back, shot in the head? That's three to okay. JFK. One to, I believe it's one to Connolly, right? That's, what is it, four? One is missed on the side is five. I don't know what's the I thing. Think it was six or Barrett. seven, right? Yeah, I don't even know. It's hard to tell. Because uh, there's this whole thing now with, with you know, undercharged bullets, uh, silencers or, or uh, suppressors and also firecrackers. So there's a lot of different angles as to noise and, and bullet sounds and stuff and fragments. It, it's, it's really difficult to put together uh, the actual number. And believe me, I've tried. It's not so easy. Yeah, well, I mean, especially something like that. Yeah, because you're dealing in fragmentation. You're dealing... The, the shots don't line up sound wise. There's a lot of different um, angles to this thing in terms of sound and, and, and metal and multiple guns and multiple guns. Yeah. yeah. So that, that makes it really difficult too. Yeah. And yeah, somebody said, and don't forget the windscreen, but we think that that's the throat shot, but anyway, yeah, yeah. The windscreen is the throat shot, but that's one, two, three. Yeah. It's three shots. Right, well, but, I mean, it's three shots from three different places. So, I mean, it's three shots from three different areas. Yeah. And <clears throat> then there's the other stuff. But on that note, this wraps up our Paul Landis coverage. And whoa, whoa. Mm -hmm. Emergency broadcasting systems are oh, signing yeah. off. This is, <laughs> as, as, as Alex Jones goes, this is emergency broadcast. Emergency broadcast, Alex Jones. And we'll see everybody on Friday. Okay. Free phone Friday. That's fun. That'll be fun. I think so.